hear me. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to uh, introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Peter Liedman, who is the director of the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research in Australia. And uh, I've been an admirer of uh, Professor Liedman's for as long as I can remember, uh, in part because not only is he uh, an extraordinarily talented individual, but because he's had that uh, unusual ability to maintain a, a humble and self-deprecating demeanor throughout his uh, incredibly stellar career. Uh, to put things in perspective, um, Peter Liebman uh, was recently made the uh, Officer of the Order of Australia. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, United Kingdom and the Commonwealth system, you may be familiar with these concepts of knighthoods and the Order of the British Empire. And, Peter received this award, arguably the, the highest and most distinguished award Australians receive uh, for his distinguished service to medicine, health and medical research as a physician scientist, to professional societies and to tertiary education. Um, as I mentioned, I've known Peter most of my life and uh, Peter was as a young man, not only a talented uh, academician uh, at that time a student, but also a talented sportsman, uh, and a, uh, I would argue, a, a talented musician. And Peter did, completed his medical studies, uh, MD and PhDs in, uh, in Australia, his clinical training in endocrinology, in endocrinology with a focus on cancer endocrinology, and then went on to conduct postdoctoral studies at Harvard Medical School. And again, to put that in perspective, you get a handful of Australians only who actually get a chance to conduct these sort of postdoctoral uh, activities uh, at the Harvard Medical School. And Peter's uh, subsequent ventures, um, really a quixotic attempts to create from the earth a world-renowned scientific research institute in Australia. And that venture really began 20 years ago where he and uh, Professor Peter Clinken, who's now the WA chief scientist, uh, began the idea of developing an internationally renowned Scientific Research Institute in Western Australia. And uh, to his extraordinary will, uh, he has done just that. Uh, the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research now is regarded as one of Australia's leading medical research institutes. Peter uh, has led that now for many, many years and uh, actively recruited talent from around the world with the goal of uh, making a sustainable impact on the outcome of how to ca treat cancers and other diseases. And I thought it would be ideal, given Peter's interest in liver disease, to introduce him to the talent pool at the Blumberg Institute. Um, the title of his talk today, you are joining uh, this seminar, The Rise and Rise of RNA Therapeutics for Liver Disease, as a, and I look forward to Peter's presentation. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Richard, thank you very much indeed for that very kind introduction. And we do go back uh, many years um, and uh, it's great to be with you. Now, I'm going to share my screen and hope this all works. And is that now sharing your screen happily? Yes, we can, see it. we can see it, Peter. Terrific. Great. Thank you. Um, and I thought what I'd do very briefly, because Richard does come from Perth uh, in Western Australia, um, uh, I'd share with you um, just a couple of slides about Western Australia, because we're about as far away as humanly possible um, from, from everyone in the Bumberg Institute. Uh, it is a beautiful city, about 2.6 million people, um, about 25 million people in Australia, and you can see where we are and versus where Bloomberg is. And this is the city and it is a very pretty place and lovely place to live. The institute that I uh, oversee is called the Harry Perkins Institute. And you can see this is the uh, central business district that I just showed you a minute ago. Uh, and this is my uh, research building and it's nestled uh, in, a, a, in an increasingly um, detailed and complex uh, campus. This is a brand new children's hospital with the Telethon Institute, uh, a number of other institutes here, an adult hospital here, and it's about 15,000 
uh, people on the campus and it's a burgeoning place to be and a wonderful place for great science. Here uh, is the Western Australian um, G08 University, uh, University of Western Australia. So it's, it's this academic milieu uh, that is changing the landscape very much uh, in Perth. This is the building, uh, the mothership. We have uh, two buildings, in fact, in two parts of Perth. You can see it's a wonderful place for collaboration, multiple universities, multiple companies, uh, and a, a significant emphasis on translational outcomes from uh, pioneering basic science. So with that very short introduction, what I'd like to do um, in the next uh, few minutes is tell you about some of the work we've been doing. Uh, I've had a long-term uh, love affair with RNA biology, uh, microRNA therapeutics, um, and in particular in poor prognostic tumours such as liver cancer, head and neck cancer, advanced melanoma, uh, and prostate cancer. Uh, and in particular, in that whole context of understanding more about therapeutic resistance uh, and can we overcome it with a, a microRNA approach. And of course, the whole world has become reorientated to um, RNA therapeutics over the last couple of years with, of course, uh, the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines. And what I think most people uh, in the non-science arena don't understand is that prior to the, the generation of these uh, wonderful uh, vaccines with a lipid nanoparticle, there was a good 15 years of research on both sides of that uh, complex that allowed the vaccines to be made in a very short time. But what I'm interested in, in the context of RNA therapeutics is uh, the, the whole a uh, group of microRNAs, over a thousand of these wonderful little 22 nucleotide uh, molecules that have just so much power. And hopefully I'll convince you today why they're such a wonderful uh, and opportunistic uh, therapeutic agent. But of course, before I get to microRNAs, I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about sRNAs and the incredible success there's been in the last yeah. two or three years. Did Excuse you... me, Peter. Um, yes. I, I wondered when you uh, share if you can put on a full slide, not presenter view. Right, I thought it was on, on my computer, it is on full slide. Let me, it's, Richard, it's, it's, it's full slide on mine. So uh, that's weird. Um, let me just try this. Is that full slide now? Because that's Conrad, full. Slide, that's full slide on my computer. Conrad, is that work now? Because I can I see it as the. No, but let's just keep going. Okay. Right. Not sure what I can do about that, Richard. Because on my computer here, it is um, all. Is that is that any better? Much better. Perfect. Okay. You got great. It. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Let's. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is in three different parts, talk about um, RNA therapeutics. First of all, the advances in double-stranded RNA mediated therapies. Second, to focus on some microRNAs in particular, the one we've been working on, microRNA7, to show some work in head and neck cancer and liver, uh, the mechanisms for overcoming treatment resistance. And then finally, to spend some time with microRNA7 as a therapeutic and uh, tell you about some of the work we've been doing in that area. And for this whole um, area of double-stranded RNA, there have been a number of very large challenges, most of which have been overcome over the last two or three years. The first was to get long half-life double-stranded RNAs into humans and for them to keep the potency. Second was to work out ways of tissue-specific delivery. And third uh, was to solve uh, the off-target effects uh, and or minimise those. And there have been some spectacular advances over the last few years, as many of you will be aware. Um, firstly, um, the, the ability to stabilise um, double-stranded RNAs with sophisticated second-generation chemistry has dramatically changed the whole field. That has allowed the first um, siRNA, Patizaran, to be approved by the FDA back in 2018. The first RNAi drug after a long, long duration of, of incredibly depressing work uh, that was unable to substantiate these drugs into the therapeutic arena, although the science behind them uh, was very compelling. And this was to treat hereditary transthyroidin amyloidosis, a reasonably rare condition, but it was a landmark uh, achievement. 
And then the second uh, major advance in this whole area and very relevant for liver disease, of course, was to use a naturally occurring receptor on the hepatocyte, the acyloglycoprotein receptor. And this receptor that sits there, um, it, 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 it recognizes galnac moieties, sugar moieties um, on uh, all sorts of um, molecules such as double stranded RNA or microRNAs, and incredibly efficiently uh, increases the uptake of the double stranded RNA into the cell 30 to 60 fold. And this has been transformed into the area of common medicine within clizaran, which was approved by the FDA early on this year. It targets the molecule that degrades the LDL receptor, which is PCSK9. And in many, many trials now across the world, uh, the most recent and prestigious in the New England Journal of Medicine back in May 2020, showed that this molecule is incredibly powerful at reducing cholesterol. So let me just show you um, uh, what I'm talking about uh, uh, from the point of view of the second generation chemistry, and then we'll look at a couple of slides of enclizaran. So the, the, as, as I mentioned, it's incredibly uh, important to consider uh, each, each of the uh, RNA nucleotides and what you can do to modify uh, the, not the sequence of course, but the stability by introducing phosphothioate to deoxy and to fluoro or to our methyl uh, residues to modify this, this, this molecule and give it a second generation chemistry um, uh, um, signature. And then of course, uh, the addition of the triantenary um, galnac uh, which has been incredibly successfully done by Alnilam by Al in a number of drugs. And, and we've actually had some success as well, You're working with a group in Europe called Microsynth. These two um, dramatic changes have changed the, the world forever of, of treating liver disease. And, and some people would say that every single liver disease is now a target and treatable target with double-stranded RNA therapeutics. Let's just go into this in a little more detail because it's important for some of the work I'm going to tell you about later. So here's the acyloglycoprotein receptor, which naturally sits on the, on the cell surface of the hepatocyte. And if we just look at the enclizarin molecule, here's the double-stranded RNA and the galnac uh, fused to it, and it's recognized by the acyloglycoprotein receptor. It's beautifully internalized and rapidly, and I mean rapidly, it's 20 to 30 minutes uh, rapid turnaround. The uh, siRNA is, is um, removed in the endosome. The receptor uh, recirculates back to the cell surface, ready to do it all over again. The RNA, or siRNA, finds its target PCSK9 and obliterates it. And the consequence of that, of course, is that LDL receptors are not degraded as rapidly. This is a remarkable receptor to say the least, because this is the distribution in human tissues, this is the distribution in human cell lines, and here it is in liver stacks of this receptor, and again in HEPG2 liver cells, essentially out of 50 different lines. It is night and day, this massive overexpression of this receptor compared to everything else, and that makes it a beautiful target uh, for liver-specific therapeutics. This is the 2020 uh, um, article in the New England Journal of Medicine, I just want to show you uh, the power of this molecule. Um, this is um, percentage uh, reduction um, in, in LDL cholesterol, and, and this is 270 days out to 540 days, and it's sustained extraordinary reduction. These are in patients already on maximum statins, and so we're in a very high-risk group, and uh, I've always been uh, amazed by this, but it's turned out to be uh, reproducible in patients. This is a subcutaneous in saline injection with extraordinary long-term effects. And this approved uh, earlier on this year will change the world of the treatment of hypercholesterolemia forever because it'll become, a, become a, a very frequently used agent. So then if you think about what I've just shown you, this really is a dawn of a new therapeutic age using double standard RNAs. Um, the, uh, in vivo stability, their selected delivery to the liver, those are solved issues that, that plagued the area for, for many years. Um, and as I said, almost every liver disease is potentially curable with double stranded RNA therapeutics. You can use this for serious precision medicine because with great uh, facility, you can now target the liver. The area is uh, expanding at a great rate. Clearly, there's a global 
uh, desire for these sort of molecules. Um, and you can see a couple of examples I put on here. Uh, the medicines company, uh, the makers of Inclizaran, uh, were purchased by uh, um, um, uh, by Regeneron. Uh, I should say by Novartis, I'm sorry, uh, and you know, serious amounts of money. So it's a burgeoning, exciting, really um, stimulating area to be in. So hopefully that gives you a bit of background. And let's go into some microRNAs because, of course, we can piggyback on a lot of the uh, discoveries that siRNAs uh, have heralded. Uh, the microRNAs uh, can piggyback on those advances. And that's, in fact, what we're doing, um, but with some very significant differences that I'm going to allude you to. Now, we've been interested in poor prognostic uh, human tumors for a long while. And in particular, those that express the EGF receptor, one of the tyrosine kinase receptors that's very well known. And a huge market still uh, for anti-EGF receptor um, therapeutics, despite the fact that every single patient who receives EGF receptor inhibitors uh, ends up uh, developing resistance. And so it's a, it's a huge problem and recurring one. I'm not going to go into the detail because a lot of this is published over many years, but essentially we did some work early on and found that microRNA7 was a very potent inhibitor of the EGF receptor, uh, both at RNA and protein level. And it does it via multiple sites in the 3 prime untranslated region of the EGF receptor. Um, and uh, again, I won't go into that in any further detail. Suffice it to say, to say that this is a really interesting uh, little molecule, 22 nucleotide, double-stranded, non-coding RNA. There are three genes in humans, suggesting that it's highly conserved and, and uh, it's an incredibly important little molecule. Its expression is restricted predominantly to brain dopaminergic uh, neurons, uh, uh, those that are responsible for Parkinson's disease and in the beta cell for, uh, for um, pancreatic development. It is one of the exemplar circular RNAs uh, that are, that's tar target MIR-7, as uh, some of you will know that some of the circular RNAs have about 70 MIR-7 binding sites, which can act as a sponge. And there is quite a bit known about its kind of transcriptional uh, and functional biology and interactions with um, RNA binding proteins. So a really interesting, um, small, non-coding RNA. Now I'd say tumor suppressor, microRNA, uh, typically lost in multiple tumors. And the tumors that I'm going to talk about today are uh, head and neck cancer and liver cancer. But as you can see on this slide, there are multiple tumors where the expression of microRNA7 is down. And the concept is very simple. Uh, it's just replacing it, but much harder to do, of course. And there are still very, very few uh, microRNA um, clinical trials uh, in progress and none actually at the bedside on a regular basis, unfortunately. Just a, a, a couple of quick slides on uh, the EGF receptor. It is a very potent inhibitor of both the RNA of the receptor and the protein. And you can see that in this uh, lung cancer, uh, brain, uh, or GBM, um, breast and prostate, it is an incredibly powerful inhibitor uh, of the expression of the protein uh, as well as the RNA. It's also one of the most potent inhibitors of phosphor AKT. And one of the key pathways is that microRNA7 inhibits is phosphor AKT, but it also takes out the phosphorylated EGF receptor from multiple different cell lines. And this is two different um, you know, you know, head and neck um, cancer cell lines, one being more resistant to tyrosine kinases, uh, but essentially very pro prominent effects on each receptor, the phosphorylated receptor in phosphor AKT. And this slide, if you're, if you're not very familiar with microRNAs, is probably one of the most important slides I'm going to show. Because the fundamental difference between siRNAs and microRNAs is siRNAs specifically are designed to target one portion of the genome uh, and, and hopefully have few side effects, so they're well tolerated. And clearly the siRNAs I've just talked about uh, are very well tolerated with very few side effects. The fundamental difference with microRNAs, they are naturally endogenously programmed to bind multiple different RNAs. And they do with great uh, affinity. So shown on this slide for microRNA7 uh, is the concept that they target this microRNA targets multiple members of multiple different pathways. So it takes out the EGF receptor uh, directly, it takes out RAF1 directly, it takes out PAC1 directly, and then indirectly it'll inhibit ERK phosphor AKT, as I've just sent, uh, shown you, CAM kinase and PR3 kinase. So it is multi-level and multi-level. Um, uh, um, 
within uh, multi multiple within one particular pathway and multiple pathways. And that's fundamentally incredibly important because they therefore should be extremely potent molecules. And in our experience, they are. So let me show you some data for um, some oral cancer uh, work that we've been doing recently. And this is about the sixth most common cancer in the world. Uh, a lot of people present with advanced disease and of course it's disfiguring surgery and incredibly difficult uh, for patients. So um, the, uh, the therapeutics uh, needs to be improved big time. We've been working with a number of different cell lines uh, and, and animal models. Uh, shown here in uh, panel A of this slide is a couple of different uh, cell lines, uh, each of which is cisplatin resistance. That is cisplatin resistance for Cal27 and Cal33 with their sister cisplat resistance line. And what you see in these EC50s is that micron A7 very powerfully whether it's the uh, non-resistant or the resistant line uh, inhibits the uh, proliferation and, and viability of these cells with, with low nanomolar um, EC50s. Similarly, uh, in proliferation assays, this is micro A7, this is the control, uh, this is the anti-mere micro A7 with no real effect. But you can see there's a, there's a, a nice uh, inhibition of, uh, of cell proliferation uh, with micro A7 in both uh, the um, Cal27 and the cisplat resistant line. A similar story is seen in colony formation assays. The bottom uh, here is a resistant line uh, and Cal27 above. And you'll see when we had micro A7, there's a significant reduction in the colony assays. And, and it's a very similar um, uh, finding in the Cal33 cisplat resistant line. So micron A7s are a potent inhibitor of proliferation uh, in these in both the non-resistant and two cisplatin resistant lines. And that, that, that's the, the first key observation is that micro A7s is powerful in both of these lines. So some in vivo work, we've done a lot of uh, injecting of, of mouse tongues, which you can do quite, uh, quite well. Um, and you can see that here that the micron A7 treated mice, be they either the Cal27 non-cisplat resistant or the cisplat resistant line, uh, micron A7 very significantly reduces the size uh, in these little mouse tongues. And if we do some work where we're stably overexpressing uh, reciferase, uh, and then we use either either microRNA7 on its own or in the context uh, of cisplatin together, you'll see that microRNA7 alone or the combination very significantly reduces uh, growth of the tongue uh, as detected by luciferose in maestro. So these sorts of studies led us to say, well, look, this looks like very interesting uh, cancer. It looks like MIR7 has a, a significant effect. Uh, let's uh, look at some of the mechanisms that are involved. Um, Oops, that's better. Um, so here we've done a, an RPPA, reverse phase protein array. Uh, and you can see that there are some very interesting uh, differences between the lines. We've, we've looked at both uh, the Cal27 cells alone or the Cal27 CSR cells. Um, and we've been interested actually in genes that are present in both uh, the resistant and the non-resistant lines. And, um, and again, the, the, there's a lot of data here, but I'm not going to go through it in any more detail other than to say that what we're finding is that micron A7 targets multiple different molecules uh, in multiple different pathways uh, in oral cancer. So just an example here of some other additional um, uh, molecules that micron A7 targets, IRS1, here's the EGF receptor, caviolin-1, uh, RAF1, uh, rel a part of the p65 uh, unit uh, so again um, additional confirmation is that there are multiple targets in these uh, cell lines and that micron a7 doesn't seem to be uh, phased in any way uh, when it's using um, as the uh, cisplat resistant line so out of that work came uh, the recognition that raf1 is a key target in cal27 cells there are a couple of um, of uh, micron A7 binding sites and the 3 prime UDR of RAF1. And we've gone ahead to do quite a lot more work to first of all validate uh, with the cifrase assays with either the wild type or the mutant uh, to show that in Cal27 and in the cisplat resistant lines, micron A7 is very potent uh, at reducing the uh, activity of the luciferose. And again, very similar findings here. When we take out RAF1 with siRNA, we get significant reduction in growth. And lastly, 
but significantly, when we do some colony assays, and again, this is in the absence of cisplatin uh, or in the presence of cisplatin, when we add one of the RAF inhibitors, GW5074, we very significantly reduce uh, the colony count. Um, so this is a very short and quick look at some work that we've done in uh, head and neck cancer. We published quite a lot in this area, uh, but micron A7 is clearly a very potent growth inhibitor uh, for both ther therapy sensitive and therapy resistant head and neck cancer cells. And what we are looking at now is an en enlarging toolbox for overcoming cisplatin resistance in, in this tumor. We can add micron A7, we can add uh, RAF inhibitors, I uh, haven't even had a chance to go through axle inhibitors, BGB324, and of course, raffinin. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, molecule in head and neck cancer and has all sorts of opportunities for us, especially as you can locally uh, inject micron A7 into the tongue. Okay, what I'd like to move on to now is some work on head and neck cancer. Uh, I'm sorry, is uh, HCC, hepatocarcinoma. So cellular carcinoma is the fifth most common cancer, as you know. Uh, it's the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths and, and a, a huge number of these come in China. Every jurisdiction has an increase in both men and women. These are Australian figures, and you can see that there's significant uh, increases in both men and women. And it's interesting that this is both incidence and mortality. And you'll see that the lines unfortunately overlap each other. So essentially, just about everyone who gets this disease unfortunately dies from it, at least in Australia. And this is the, uh, the standardised mortality rates in Australia over about a 40 year period. And you'll see that liver cancer has gone dramatically uh, up and uh, is predicted to be the worst prognostic tumour by 2035. So what does micron A7 do in this tumor? Well, it's again, very powerful indeed. So in EC50s, um, you can see the H87 or, or HEP3B cells, which are two very commonly used cell lines. Uh, micron A7 is a potent inhibitor uh, of the proliferation and cell viability of these cells. And again, as I've shown you previously, um, there's a powerful uh, inhibition of phosphate AKT and of course the EGF receptor. So very similar findings, but in very different cells. What about when we use first generation? I draw your attention to the fact that these were first generation chemically modified micron A7, uh, micron A7 mimics. Um, when we take this experiment um, with orthotopic uh, in uh, implantation of these cells into the mouse liver, and we chase them uh, with our alpha feta protein, and we start treating mice when the alpha feta protein is about at a thousand. This is a log scale. What you'll see here is the micron A7 treated mice don't really change their our feta protein much at all, but there's a two log change in the control mice. Uh, and most importantly, when you look at the um, impact on the, on the liver itself, uh, essentially after about two weeks of this first generation microRNA7 mimic, um, basically, basically it's imp almost impossible to find other tumors in six of the mice. So a very powerful uh, in vivo uh, orthotopic uh, impact of microRNA7 in HCC. It, when you explore, and we've done a lot of exploration of the functional biology of this molecule uh, it, uh, on, in, in RNA-seq, it, it really impacts on the sorts of things that you'd expect, cell proliferation, cell survival, gene expression, cell movement, uh, nothing particularly surprising there. It is interesting though, that we've gone hunting for other molecules that micron A7 might target and be uh, an inhibitor of. And using a phosphor RTK array, we, we identified Tyro3, which is a member of the AXL MERTK and uh, Tyro3 threesome, another set of tyrosine kinase receptors. And it turns out that micron A7 is a really powerful inhibitor of uh, Tyro3 expression at both protein and RNA level. And there is a single but very potent um, uh, uh, micron A7 binding site in the 3' UTR of Tyro3. Importantly, uh, Tyro3 in HCC has a very poor prognosis uh, as shown here um, using um, uh, a data set from TCGA. And again, looking at the TCGA data set, you can see that it's more highly expressed in, uh, in HCC uh, compared to normal tissue. So an, an emerging story for Tyro 3 as a, one, a target, and two, a poor prognostic factor in HCC. 
This, for those who aren't particularly familiar with this group, it's a very interesting group of molecules indeed. Uh, Tyro3 has been shown to be aberrantly expressed in a number of different cancers, and AXL certainly is aberrantly expressed in a, in a significant number of, of uh, cancers. And there are several trials uh, of uh, a molecule called BGB324, which is an inhibitor of AXL. And so there are several uh, trials of lung cancer, melanoma, and uh, in first, first and second phase at the present time. So it's a very interesting molecule indeed. So this slide just very briefly describes uh, an updated version of the previous slide to give you the, uh, and reinforce the concept that the EGF receptor, Tyro3, uh, two tyrosine kinase and, uh, in, uh, mo molecules in the cell membrane, both powerfully inhibited by microRNA7. RAF is powerfully inhibited by IRS1, IRS2, mTOR, NF-kappa-B, FAC, PAC1, all direct and then indirect inhib inhibition of uh, AKT, uh, MEK, BERT, RAS and PI3 kinase. So this is a, this is a, a, a serious uh, impact on, on growth with, again, multiple pathways and multiple parts of each pathway being impacted. And what about um, serafinin resistance? So we've we've generated multiple serafinin resistant HCC cell lines, and essentially they all take on an EMT type uh, phenotype. And here there's a couple of the lines: SR1 and SR2, and significant serafinin resistance. And when they when we generate the serafinin resistance over many months, uh, interestingly enough, the MIR7 expression levels go down. Not not. Too surprising in real terms, given that they're taking on a very different EMT type phenotype. But what is interesting is that each of these uh, two lines, SR1 and SR2, generated from HOH7 cells, have got very different uh, drivers. AXL, interestingly enough, uh, from the group of Tyro3 AXL and MERTK, is aberrantly expressed in SR1. Um, and uh, EGF receptors and phospho AKT look like the key drivers uh, in the SR2 line. And interestingly enough, in the SR2 line, uh, Tyro3 messenger RNA is ma massively increased uh, compared to uh, SR1. So very different um, uh, phenotypes uh, starting from the original same cell. And of course, when we add micro 7 as you might predict in this context, knowing it's such a potent inhibitor um, of uh, HCC activity in the context of serafinib, it restores serafinib sensitivity and very substantially reduces the EC50 from around 75 back to about two uh, micromolar. So a very potent effect. And we've done a lot of work in, uh, in multiple different lines. And again, the effect is, is uh, very well conserved. The principal component analysis is shown here in figure A, suggests that these, these three lines are very different and they are. Um, and I've shown you some of the biology uh, that underlies that. And of course, we've done uh, quite a bit of RNA-seq and uh, exploring each, each of the bits of these differences between uh, these molecules here. Uh, and just, uh, I don't have time to go into much detail in this area, but. Uh, we have uh, come across uh, caviolin-1 as a very interesting cell membrane-like located molecule that's evidently expressed in quite a lot of cancers. Um, and um, this next fluorescent slide just gives you a, 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 a little peek into some of the work that we've been doing with caviolin-1. On the left-hand side of the slide uh, are the parental cells SR1, SR2, and it's the staining for caviolin-1. And you can see this is a massive overexpression in both of the uh, serafinib-resistant lines. If I take you down to this part of the slide, when we treat these, these cell lines with micro 7 it's a very powerful inhibition of caviolin-1. There's a whole lot of data uh, that I don't have time to show you that implicates uh, the relationship between micro 7 and caviolin-1. It's a really interesting and important one um, in, uh, in these uh, serafinib resistant cells. So clearly HCC tumors uh, with abundant EGF receptor, Tyro3, phospho AKT and CAV1, CAV1 expression are excellent targets for micro 7 therapy. And this is going to be a significant proportion of uh, HCCs across the globe. What we know is that micro 7 very effectively and coordinately turns off uh, EGF receptor and Tyro3 signaling at multiple levels in HCC. It's fascinating that serafinib resistant involves multiple members of the same TAM that is 
you know, Tyro 3, uh, AXL and MERTK receptor family, much to our surprise. Uh, and we've seen now in multiple different scenarios, microRNA 7 receptor sensitivity to and is synergistic with serafinib in HCC. So with that backing and that sort of data set, we have embarked over the last uh, two or three years on microRNA 7 as a, as a potential therapeutic. But a small company called Miravan uh, that's been going for quite some time uh, and is in the context of commercializing this agent. And I want to come back to this slide I showed you before for Inclizarin, because I want to focus now on uh, MRX7. Uh, very similar, of course, we've generated uh, uh, multiple different second generation modified um, uh, versions of microRNA7, which we call uh, MRXs. Um, and the concept here is exactly the same as it is for glycerin, that we should be able to use uh, the solid glycoprotein receptor to deposit um, the uh, microRNA7 into the endosome for it then to exit into the cytoplasm and take out the EGF receptor and all of the other molecules I've just been talking about. So that's the, the basis for the work. Is the solid glycoprotein receptor present uh, in HCC? Well, the answer to that is on this slide and it's been published. And the answer is yes, indeed. This is normal liver up the top and uh, HCC down below. Yeah, green for EGF receptor and red for solid glycoprotein receptor. And you can see that it's very present indeed. Uh, it may be reduced in high grade tumors, but it's certainly present uh, in the, the, the lower grades. Um, and there's no doubt that it tends to co-associate with the EGF receptor, both the tyrosine kinases, and they sit on the cell membrane together. So we've made multiple second generation chemistry um, uh, modifications and multiple oligos um, for uh, microRNA 7 mimics. We've conjugated some of these to Galnac, which is not easy at all if the chemistry is complex and challenging. Uh, and we've evaluated multiple of these in vitro with multiple assays. And this is a, just a simple schematic, whoops, that, Uh, that um, I showed you before. Um, here, here's the microRNA. It's dressed up with multiple different second generation mole uh, molecules to stabilize it. And here's the triantenary uh, um, galnac, which uh, is binds to the acyl glycoprotein receptor. So let me show you some data from MRX7, which is the lead compound that we have. It has an EC50 uh, around uh, one to two nanomolar, much the same as what you can buy across the counter, it's made by Ambion. It's just as potent. If I take you through that, it's this is the, the first of every one of the three here is microRNA7. The second one is MRX7, and the, the third one is MRX7 plus Galnac. And you'll see that, that essentially these are equally potent um, with the off-the-shelf Ambion version uh, of microRNA7. These are very potent molecules that are inhibiting the EGF receptor, both MRX7 or the Galnat variant, variant, and similarly just blows uh, phosphate KT out of the water. Um, and interestingly, if we do an experiment where we don't add lipid nanoparticles uh, to the transfection experiment, just to, to indicate that the Galnat actually works. Um, so here's some cells that have not been uh, transfected with the with, uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles, and you'll see there's really no impact on the EGF receptor expression for when we use MRX7, but when we conjugate it to Galnac, we significantly reduce EGF receptor expression. Now, on the right-hand side here in panel E, what I'd like to show you are a couple of different interesting RNA stability assays, where we've either used human serum or snake venom to, to basically try as hard as we can to degrade either the Ambion U7 or MRX7. And you'll see that the Ambion oh, across the shelf um, micron A7 just degrades incredibly rapidly. Uh, MRX7 uh, degrades, but much less slowly. And in snake venom, it's a very similar loss of uh, expression, a loss of activity, I should say, in the ambion. But you can see MRX7 is very stable out to about three hours. So we think that this is a pretty stable molecule given the sorts of assays that are available for assessing uh, in, 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 oh, I'm sorry, in vitro um, stability. Um, and the last bit of data here is that this molecule MRX7 does not seem to in any way in, enhance inflammatory markers. And certainly this is from the cytokine storm point of view, a potential um, issue. Uh, whether we look at um, 
uh, changes in ALT, changes in TNF alpha, or a reporter assay with NF, uh, NF kappa B. So, so it's uh, it, it, from from the from this perspective, it doesn't look like that there's any pro-inflammatory um, activity to this molecule. So to sum up um, the, uh, the the data with our HCC therapeutic, uh, it's very very effective second generation mo molecule. Uh, we've made multiple MIR7 mimics, uh, and we've got some lead compounds, two of them, MRH7, which we can deliver with uh, LNPs. And we're currently collaborating with Peter Cullis at UBC Canada, and Peter Cullis generated the LNPs for the Pfizer uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and MRX7 Galnac, which we deliver subcutaneously with Salon. We've got a portfolio of grounded international patents uh, on the molecule. And as I mentioned earlier, a little company uh, uh, called Miravan that's uh, commercializing these discoveries. Why do we think that microRNA7 as MRX7, um, uh, with this second generation modified molecule, is, a, is, is likely to be a useful therapeutic? Well, we can. Uh, we can target it specifically to the liver, and I haven't shown you data for that, but it goes specifically to the liver. It, it blocks multiple pathways. Uh, it's replacing a natural molecule. I've shown you on several different uh, ways it Im improves and over overcomes serafinib and other uh, drug you know, uh, uh, resistance. Uh, it looks as if it's going to be pretty safe uh, from everything that all of our studies. It's going to have sustained effectiveness. And again, remember that Inclusoran is given on a six monthly basis. Um, and it, it can clearly be used in the context of serafinib and other agents. So it looks like it's uh, non toxic and will be a useful adjunct uh, in multiple different cancers. I suppose I like this slide because it does bring up the whole concept of where these potential drugs are in the context of, of treatment of cancer. So back in the 50s, we had cytotoxic chemotherapy, monoclonal antibodies, 1990s, targeted proteins in the early 2000s, immunotherapy, obviously, for the last seven or eight years at the bedside. SNRNAs have really come on stream in the last two or three years. And of course, I'm putting here uh, microRNAs, wouldn't it be good if they were uh, at the bedside by 2023? Now, with all this work, uh, you'd all know that, that uh, you need a great team to do this work uh, in multiple different scenarios. Uh, this is my lab team, uh, and I'd like to thank Tasnuva Kabir, who does a lot of work in HCC. Kirsty is fantastic with the animals. Felicity did a lot of work on in, in head and neck cancer. Diane uh, and Ricky uh, in other aspects. Uh, Diane in uh, some of the HCC work and Ricky in some of the head and neck work. And I've got a, a whole stack of collaborators who are great to work with and fantastic people. Uh, and I'd like to thank the uh, funding bodies who have been so supportive of, uh, of this work and clearly want to see it get to the bedside. And Richard, the last two slides, I just want to bring to people's attention that we're, and, and I know that I'm talking in an institute that, that is very attuned to liver. Uh, we received an $11 million grant uh, a year or so ago to set up a substantial uh, consortium. It's called the Liver Cancer Collaborative in West in Perth, Western Australia. And you can see there's a there's a uh, there's another 30 or 40 people behind these people, which are the PIs. Um, and the, the goal, of course, is to make a difference to HCC. But we've now got uh, several platforms uh, in place, including uh, genomic platforms uh, and um, organoid platforms, we've got bioprinters, and it's a very sophisticated uh, setup. And the goal is to um, increase the amount of, of biopsies that are taken. And we've been able to convince the hepatologists to do lots of biopsies. So this pathway is now incredibly active with a, a biobank, multi-omics, uh, a lot of informatics. Um, and of course, some of the key questions we're asking around tumor heterogeneity, therapeutic resistance, metastasis, and the role of the microenvironment. So I thought I'd let you know about this because I'm sure you'll be hearing more about it as we publish uh, consortium and collaborative papers. Uh, and I think one of the interesting areas that we're involved in is, is more advanced disease. And our hepatologists are very happy uh, through our radiologists and interventional radiologists to do a lot of biopsies, which of course um, you need to uh, make the diagnosis for HEC. So I might leave it at there. Very happy, of course, to take any questions and, and uh, hopefully the technology has worked well.
Peter, thank you so much for that uh, crystal clear presentation that really uh, helps, I think, anyone who's not familiar with this technology to understand just how uh, the, the field has moved uh, and how precise the therapies are and the future as you see it. And I think for those who aren't so familiar, in broad terms, this reflects a shift from targeting inhibiting oncogenes to reintroducing tumor suppressors to uh, block the onset and progression of tumor genesis. Peter, could I ask, um, just to get the ball rolling, two quick questions. Sure, sure. One which relates to science and then one which relates to, uh, in some ways, a, an important agenda. I didn't want to forget that agenda, which relates to mechanisms of collaboration with the consortium that you've set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I was very interested to see the induction of caviar and one in the um, mm. resistant tumors and you know there's a lot of discussion around you know where caviar and is uh, as to how it functions you know different tissues different compartments within a tissue and you know um, there's been a lot of interest for example in breast cancer where in the stroma caviar and one seems to be a, a more of a tumor suppressor um, have you had a chance to see where caviar one is in the resistant uh, tumors in the tissues is it in the epithelial yeah. cells or the stroma yeah look we have richard and 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 you know this is part of a paper that will come out pretty big paper actually that will come out um hopefully soon um we've done some single cell work and um i, I understand that it appears to be in uh, a very interesting group of hepatocytes um interestingly enough and doesn't appear to be in the microenvironment and so so that that uh, and, and Tasnuva Kabir has been doing this work. And there's some really interesting th um, aspects of caviolin one because it sits on the cell membrane. Right? So, so it's, it's part of the lipid rafts. But, and, and there's some very interesting papers suggesting that it sits quite close to and modifies the, the, the stoichiometry and, and physical structure of some of the tyrosine kinase receptors. It's really interesting, actually. So, so some of the chemistry there suggests some very interesting interplays. And certainly from some of the stuff that we've been doing, you can see that the, the, it's co, it looks like it's co-expressed or very physically close to, with EGF receptor, for example. So there's some really interesting things happening at the cell membrane. And, and then in addition, it's aberrantly expressed and looks like it plays roles intracellularly as well. And we certainly aren't the experts in that, but it's a very interesting and fascinating field because it's not, this is not the only tumor where caviolin one is, is overexpressed in, in more aggressive tumors. Um, so there's some, some interesting answers and I obviously haven't had a chance to show you all the data, but it's a, it's a fascinating area. So we will have to invite you back for a second talk. <laughs> it, um, I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just, um, you know, the, the Blumberg is really um, a central node in a lot of global interactions in the area of uh, hepatitis and consequent cancer, um, probably one of the central nodes in the world. And I wondered if you could share, uh, given yeah. Tim Block's uh, on the line here and has a series of questions, which I hope you can see, but oh, okay. if, you yeah, could, right. if you could well, just you share want, this big picture. Do you want to answer the question, Richard, about the collaboration? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. So, so look, the, the, the collaboration um, started about a year and a bit ago, uh, and essentially um, it, it came from the, from the recognition by, by myself, uh, and I'm co-lead with it, that in every cancer except HCC, there's a biopsy. But, but the clinical diagnosis of HCC, much to my surprise initially, is predominantly by AFP and MRI. And, and yet we know that you need the molecular phenotype and the molecular history of these tumours to, to really bring any precision medicine if you're going to do it. So we have um, had a, a, a lot of really interesting discussions with our hepatologists, and the goal is to change clinical practice such that pretty much every HCC gets a biopsy. And when you start doing that, then you start generating a database and tissue bank, and you can do single cell and spatial transcriptomics on, it, on every sample that comes through. And you can set up your uh, organoid platform. And we've now got a whole bunch of our HCC organoids going. So, so it's, it's quite a large collaborative collecting from three hospitals, hundreds of samples uh, a year. Uh, and it's going to be an enormously rich and valuable database because we are, we've got a reasonable amount of money to um, generally um, interrogate 
each tumour as it comes out, and then start, as I said, to answering those questions about tumour heterogeneity. So, um, and, and, and microenvironment involvement and, and overcoming resistance. But, it, but it's based fundamentally on getting tissue from as many patients as humanly possible. Uh, and in fact, believe it or not, tomorrow morning, I'm going to one of our rural Perth hospitals uh, to talk to the hepatologists there and to continue to convince them that doing the biopsy is one is pretty safe. There's very few uh, complications because these are fine needle uh, biopsies. And so this is, this is not true cut. This is a fine needle, which means that you can still do all sorts of single cell, you know, advanced genomics and, trans and spatial transcriptomics and organoid uh, generation uh, from very small amounts of tissue. It's amazing. And so that's the basis of collaboration. We, you know, looking to continue uh, to collaborate with whoever might like to in that context. Peter, too, in, in just in broad terms, then, um, in order to facilitate potential interactions with the Blumberg, what would be yeah. the platform um, moving forward? Would it be a, because um, there are quite a lot of uh, valuable resources and people um, yeah. at, at yeah. the Blumberg. So, that could... Yeah, look, look, I think it would be good um, for potentially for you and I to chat after, off air and, and just talk about, you know, how that might work. But certainly there's a, it's a group of really great uh, hepatologists and, and liver uh, lovers who do lots of fundamental pioneering work and lots of clinicians as well, and very passionate about translation. And I think I'm, I'm not that familiar with what the Blumberg, I know it's a terrific institute with a lot of skills. Uh, and I think there would be some, uh, the Venn diagrams would I think uh, cross over quite nicely in some areas and very happy to talk about it, of course. It's great, Peter, there's a bunch of questions. Can you see the, okay. uh, yeah, you I can. leave, leave in, you to in, those. Yeah, okay, in the Q&A, so Timothy Block is asking, are EGF receptor inhibitors used in HCC? I think they were initially, uh, Timothy, but but not now because they didn't turn out, unfortunately, in the clinical trials. Um, so I think you're quite correct. They're not frontline therapy. Interestingly enough, there was a landmark paper about a year and a half ago, I suppose, about a combination of, uh, of uh, VEGF inhibitor and immunotherapy. Um, that looked like it was going to be beneficial. Talking to the hepatologists, um, it, uh, it, it looks like there's a small group of patients who respond well and do very well with that combination, but the vast majority, and in particular, those patients who, who develop HCC from a NASH background, that is non-alcoholic steatotic hepatitis background, they don't seem to respond well to, to the combination of immunotherapy with VEGF inhibitor. So I think that's where the current state of play is, and I'll learn a little bit more tomorrow from my hepatology colleagues uh, who will give me an update. So the second one, how much has microRNA differ from short antisense? Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, microRNAs have natural targets, I guess they, and, that, and the suggestion is um, that um, sRNAs target a specific place in the genome only, and that is, for example, sRNA against PCSK9, Timothy, that is uh, you know, dedicated to find that part of the genome and, and uh, lock onto it and produce RNA decay or translational in inhibition. The difference between that and microRNAs are microRNAs are endogenous, they're being expressed from the genome all the time, and they are programmed, programmed beautifully and I love it. I think about it like an orchestra at times because they're programmed to target about 100 or 150 different sites in the genome. And so what I've shown you today, at least in cancer cells, you know, I, can, uh, I should say EGF receptor, tyrose 3, IRS1, IRS2, FAC, you know, there's just this, this huge list of molecules and they do it coordinately. So when you add microRNA7 to a cell, it will find all of these wonderful endogenous targets and take them out. It's just fantastic. And of course, it's preordained. It's in our genes. I love it. So I think that's the difference. And hopefully you can understand that there's a single hit versus a multiple hit. Um, the next one is, hold on. Uh, could you please comment on how effective we are with the delivery of microRNA? I assume different tissues may require different targeting approaches. A really great uh, question because this is the holy grail if we can somehow work out how to deliver to every tissue. The low hanging fruit, even without a, a GALNAC um, conjugate onto your uh, siRNA or your microRNA, um, the low hanging, hanging fruit, if you inject something intravenously, uh, it will go to the liver. That's, that's just a given. But if you can put a, a GALNAC 
onto it, which we have, you can deliver it with even more efficiency uh, to the liver. And I think that's very exciting. So we have, as I mentioned, we have a, a non-GALNAC and we have a GALNAC MRX7. Uh, they get delivered differently. The non-GALNAC one would be wrapped up in a lipid nanoparticle and delivered intravenously. And the GALNAC one would be given uh, in saline subcutaneously. So completely different ways of, of, of uh, giving them. And yes, you, we can put a, a, a GALNAC onto microRNA, uh, onto the uh, passenger strand, and we are in the middle of looking at all of those studies uh, in mice now. Um, what, this is um, someone from uh, the UK. What's the profile expression of MIR-7? Are these microRNAs with different targets part of master regulators during development and later stages? But great question. Um, the profile of microRNA7 it is pretty restricted. Uh, it's present in the beta cell uh, in developing um, uh, mice and humans and, and may well play a role in insulin uh, regulation and beta cell function uh, early on in life, as it were. And it's, uh, we know it's expressed in the substantia nigra, which is involved in, in Parkinson's disease um, and a couple of other areas as well um, in the brain. Um, but the restricted nature of it is interesting and still yet to be understood truly clinically. Um, and it's, that's, that's probably, uh, that's the best answer I can give you for that one there. What's the function of micro 7 in normal hepatocytes? Um, good, good question. Um, what we know is that in normal hepatocytes, um, this molecule is still targeting the same um, it's the same uh, you know, 100 to 150 different RNAs. Um, so it has a role, an obligatory role, as it were. That's when it's lost and the expression is lost as, a, as a, in the tumor suppressor context, that the, um, the expression of molecules such as Tyro3 and such as the EGF receptor um, become aberrantly overexpressed in the absence of the tumor suppressor uh, function of uh, micro seven. Okay. Um, what are the effects of GALNAC? Um, MIR-7 on liver function. Look, to date, um, we have not seen any aberrant effect at all. And certainly the other siRNAs, such as Inclusoran, which is with a, has a GALNAC, incredibly well tolerated in humans um, and uh, less side effects than the, um, than the um, placebo, or as it were, incredibly well tolerated. And that's incredibly important because Inclusoran is going to be used by millions of people for the control of their cholesterol. Timothy asks another question, how does microRNA deliver exogenously, as is done therapeutically, avoid activating innate host defences as done uh, in mRNA? Um, so look, this is a good question as well. Um, what we know is that some siRNAs activate toll-like receptor 3, uh, and so this is a, a major issue and part of the cytokine storm uh, problems that have been faced with microRNAs before. I think that what we know is that certainly TLR3 is not aberrantly affected by microRNA7, and this may well be a very microRNA uh, dependent. Um, and uh, again, the second generation chemistry uh, hopefully here will have a play a role in potentially reducing this uh, as a, as a, as a, uh, an issue. But certainly for microRNA 34, for anyone who's worked in this area for a while, microRNA 34 got into phase one clinical trials uh, for a bunch of different cancers, including renal cell carcinoma and HCC. Looked like it was working pretty well for about 50 or 60 patients and then two patients developed cytokine storm. And my understanding was potentially uh, there was some activation of some of the immune pathways that were unexpected uh, with, with first generation chemistry. Um, I think I've answered uh, this one more. Um, why do you think the, that the three pathways are specific to liver cancer alone? Not quite sure what um, this, this person means here. What, what I can say, of course, is that, and I've showed you in a couple of different formats, is that every single microRNA, whether it's microRNA 7 or microRNA uh, you know, uh, 21, um, they, they all work in the same way. So, so again, just to reiterate, multiple pathways and multiple parts of those pathways get impacted upon because the microRNA sits on all these different um, three prime UTRs or predominantly three prime UTRs, and that produces uh, a, a, a massive but beautifully coordinated uh, inhibition of cell function for tumor suppressor 
microRNAs. And obviously there are microRNAs that are oncogenic as well. Um, so I think that's on, on the Q&A, Richard, um, on the chat. I think I think you've covered the questions, and uh, I think I have to. Yeah, sure. Can I, um, at this juncture, formally thank you on behalf of the Blumberg for your presentation today. Uh, I think for any of the students, uh, there's a lot of people listening. Um, just to take a, a page out of Peter's book and recognise that not only has Peter developed uh, uh, through leadership from the ground up over the last twenty years the building of the premier research institute in the country but has continued his focus on the, the details of the research at such a level uh, in order to develop a technology and commercialize it. And finally, uh, throughout this time, he continues his work as a clinician. So it is possible. Uh, it is unusual. And Peter, I, I thank you, um, not just for your presentation, but to, as a role model for those who are listening of what's possible. Um, Perhaps going forward, I could set up a, a Zoom call of some sort with yeah. the Blumberg leadership um, and yourself, to chat a little bit about the potential opportunity for, you know, bring the, these global resources together to help yeah. patients long term, um, which is the mutual yeah. goal of uh, everyone listening to this webinar. So again, yeah, Peter, that, a heartfelt thanks. Be great, yeah. And look, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's um, about 10 o'clock at night over here, and it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Peter. Bye-bye now. See you. Bye-bye.